Okay, welcome everybody to this latest Thailand social science seminar. These are seminars that um, we run as a collaborative venture between the University of Sydney Southeast Asia Center, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies in Copenhagen and the New York Southeast Asia Network, obviously in New York. So every month we do a seminar on some social science related topic involving Thailand and we rotate the hosting of these seminars between the three uh, main outfits that are involved in it as well as our local host in Thailand, Sony Alexander at uh, Ubon Rajatani University. So. I'm Duncan McCargo. I'm director of the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies and a political science professor at the University of Copenhagen. Although tonight I'm speaking to you from Manila, where I've just been observing the election. But it's my really great pleasure today to be joined by Anwar Komar, who's going to be talking to us about re-examining the operation of hate speech in Thailand, the case of Buddhists and Muslims. This is a topic very close to my heart. And Ajahn Anwar is a lecturer in the Faculty of Political Science at Prince of Songkla University at Batani campus. He is currently working on his PhD in international relations at Dotus Eylül University in Turkey. He has a wide range of interests, including state violence against Muslim minorities in Southeast Asia, ethnic politics, and the topic of today's seminar, online hate speech. Anwar, welcome to the Thailand Social Science Seminar. Well, thank you very much, Professor uh, Duncan, for inviting me to uh, join this program. Uh, I feel I feel very humble, you know, to 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 join and, and speak on this topic. Uh, I I actually first uh, got an interest on this topic, you know, from from uh, reading your articles, you know, in which has been published in around two thousand nine, you know. The topic is about, is, is about the politics of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist identity, I guess. Yeah, that, that is the title of, of, of the article. So uh, from, 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 from that point, you know, uh, it has been my, my curiosity that, well, in, in this, in this uh, region, you know, in Southern Thailand, uh, how a Muslim and Buddhist has been interacting and how the dynamics of you know Buddhist and Muslim has been evolving. So tonight uh, I'm speaking from Tani, uh, from being of Songkla University, uh, and I will be you know uh, presenting uh, to you on our new uh, findings, which I has also been working with Tani forums uh, with my colleagues uh, Ajahn Ekarim Tuan Siri as well. So uh, can I? start my presentation now. Oh, all right, thank you. So can you see my uh, second slide? Not yet. No. Okay. Now we see it. All right. Well, uh, tonight uh, topic will be focused on how the relation between Buddhists and Muslim uh, in certain Thailand and in, in Thailand uh, in general has been evolving. Uh, and one of the pressing issue, you know, in, in this topic uh, was that, well, the conflict in uh, Southern Thailand, you know, has uh, caught the attentions of scholar for many years. And, you know, the, the problems between, the problem in this, in this area in Southern Thailand is normally focused on the vertical conflict between the state and insurgents. Uh, well, when we, when we say insurgents, we mean uh, Malay Muslim uh, groups who take arms you know, to fight against the state. So many scholars, many studies that uh, try to understand the, the, the violent conflict in this area, you know, mostly focus on uh, how the state has been responding to uh, this Malay Muslim minorities and how Malay Muslim minority, you know, has been uh, resisting you know, against the state. This has been, I think, uh, it has been a large, uh, large, large body of the study already on, on this one. But one of the pressing issue, you know, on uh, Buddhist and Muslim uh, relations in, in these regions 
is the transformations you know, of the conflict, uh, of the horizon, uh, vertical conflict between the state and Malay Muslim insurgents uh, to become you know, the horizontal conflict that is between Buddhists and Malay Muslim. And we have seen this you know, from 2004 uh, at the beginning of the second wave of the violence that the, the insurgents has been targeting not only the state uh, or its agents, but also they have trying to target, soft target as well, such as Buddhists and monks. So this has been a worrying uh, trend, you know, around, uh, around, around this uh, 10 years already. And well, what we do not know very well is that this conflict transformations from the ver vertical uh, forms to become a horizontal forms, you know, how it has been uh, evolving. Uh, actually, Professor Duncan has been trying to argue that, you know, uh, well, as he uh, came to Patani and do a few works, and he has also uh, uh, portrayed as the religious torrents in this country has been in decline, you know, and we have seen that as well. But the thing is that today, you know, in the in the in the era that we have uh, social media as a as a key platform for interacting between people, how this conflict has been transformed, you know, that has been uh, one of our key, uh, key questions that we want to understand further, and this is perhaps the starting point. Uh, of of you know our project with with Patani Forum. So let me come to the example of what I have said. You know that uh, the 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 religious tolerance has been in decline. Uh, this example has been one of the key you know a turning point in uh, Buddhist and Muslim relations. If you see that, you know, this has been a message from uh, the former monks, you know, Pratmaha Apishat. He has been trying, you know, in two, 2015 to 2017, trying to uh, campaign, you know, that, well, uh, the, the conflict between um, Malay Muslim and state has not been uh, confined you know, to, to top down uh, violence, but because Malay Muslim has been targeting Buddhists and Hmong as well. So this is no more uh, a vertical conflict, you know, and we have seen this kind of thing happened around 2015 onwards. Uh, one of, uh, you can see in the slide, you know, the message that he has been trying to, to, to to explain is that, well, uh, all certain bandits are Islam, you know, and uh, you see another message, you know, trying to uh, give this message to his followers is that, well, Buddhist is in decline, you know, and the threat is not from within, but it's from outside, it's from other religions. So because of that, you know, he invites his followers to arm themselves and protect Buddhism. And as you can see, it's very clear that the enemies, you know, in his mind at that time uh, was, was Islam. So you can see that this, you know, today we can call this kind of message as a dangerous uh, speech. It's called further than a hate speech. Uh, so what I would like to, to show, you know, in, in this slide is that, well, we can, we can see from the message that it has not only a kind of bias reproductions about Muslim minority, but it's go further than that to incite, you know, violence against uh, this minority. So uh, along this, you know, event, we also see the new development in the regional, uh, in, in, in the regional levels. That is the, 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 the rise of Buddhist nationalism in Myanmar. Actually, you know, uh, Buddhist nationalist movement in Myanmar has been on rise 
since 2012 in Rakhine State, right? And we have seen that, you know, when Buddhist nationalist movement has been on rise, the decline has been on the religious tolerance between these two ethnic groups. The concern, you know, in, in certain Thailand is that this vertical conflict, you know, has not been confined, you know, to that form, but it has been spilled over you know, to be, to not only to become Buddhist and Muslim in certain Thailand, you know, but this kind of conflict had spread out, you know, throughout the country. And the thing that we uh, do not understand very well is that uh, in the era where Facebook, you know, has been a key platform for people to interact, how hate speech has been, or how Facebook, you know, has been playing a role in this kind of conflict. So we come to focus on how people has been, you know, uh, has been using uh, Facebook, you know, to spread their heads against against the, the the Muslim minority in the country. There is actually another studies, you know, came out uh, two years two years ago. Uh, this one is published by Asia Center, and uh, well, one of the finding was that there are four forms of hate speech that has been you know, normalized in Southeast Asia. And the first two has been ethnic and religious minority-based hate speech. And the second one is, a, is based on a political ideology. So we can see that the pacing issue in, in, in these regions has been the, 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 the hate speech, which is focused on ethnic and religious minority. And of course, Thailand, our situation in Southern Thailand has been one of the key example. Actually, the work from Bhutanese Forum has been trying to understand this phenomenon as well. You know, we has been uh, trying to, to, to understand why uh, this kind of campaign, you know, our Buddhist movement, uh, not only in Southern Thailand, but actually, you know, from 2012, uh, it has been a kind of campaign against uh, most construction in in uh, Uyen Pa Pao, uh, which is located in Chiang Rai, a province in the north of Thailand. So we have seen, you know, a campaign and movement of Buddhists uh, against uh, Muslim affairs, such as you know most constructions, hijab, and halal industry. So we went to to the north and northeast of of the country. Uh, conduct interview and, and focus groups, trying to understand what has been happening. And we produced two uh, works based on two years uh, studies. The, uh, the, the first one has been uh, the understanding uh, entire Islam sentiment in the North. And the second one, you know, we came to conceptualize that, well, the country has been uh, on a fragile society. Uh, if we do not do anything much to prevent this, you know, the situation in Thailand might be like what happened, you know, in Myanmar and Sri Lanka. And another work that we have uh, worked with our colleagues in, in Thailand is to try to understand Islamophobia in Thailand. And that one has been published in 2019, you know, with the edited books on religions and violence. So, uh, the question is that why do we have to re-examine Buddhist and, and Muslim relations? The problem is that, well, we might understand that, you know, uh, as I have shown you in the beginning, that Pramaha Abhishad has been the key figures, you know, trying to uh, promote some kind of Islamophobia in, in, in Thailand. But uh, unfortunately, he was forced to disrupt, you know, in 2017. So the thing is that after 2017, uh, 2017 what, what, what has been the situations, you know, around these topics? Uh, so based on that, you know, we came to focus on online social medias and we want to know the volume of hair switch against Muslim minority. Uh, and if we can have that kind of volumes, you know, uh, perhaps we can understand the trends, patterns and level of hair speech. And perhaps, you know, there might be some key findings about the correlation between 
physical violence in the southern Thailand and the hate speech around the topic. So we try to focus you know, these problems on two levels. Local levels means we try to focus an understanding of the operation of hate speech in the conflict in southern Thailand. And on the national levels, we try to understand the, the, the Muslim and Buddhist relations you know, outside uh, the conflict areas. So we start you know, to, to adopt new methodology in order to understand this. So what I would like to, to highlight in this slide is that we went to uh, uh, focusing on online platform. You know, on online platform, we have to use a new tool such as social listening and monitoring. These are two different tools you know, in, in order to collect data. And we went as well you know, to, to meet uh, experts in order to interview and have a focus groups. We went to Bangkok, Chiang Mai, and we conduct a certain uh, uh, many, many uh, uh, focus groups, you know, with Buddhists and Muslim in in southern Thailand as well. So these perhaps are stepped, uh, but I, I don't want to go in detail on this. But I want to to just mention that well, that there is a step in in doing this kind of research. Uh, when we do a social listening uh, analysis, you know, we have to come up with a certain keyword first. That these keywords, you know has been some kind of uh, example that we can go back to the definition of hate speech. And then we collect this data from, from social listening tools, you know, such as Sanru and Social Eyes uh, in, in the case of Thailand. And uh, the, the, the problems you know, during working on this is that, well, it is we, we, because we receive the data a lot and we have to go through data cleansing process. And from that one, you know, we when we got the final message about the hair speech, we use that to characterize, you know, based on four levels, uh, which uh, we, we we got this framework from from an interview. So I will go very quickly about the findings that uh, we got from our uh, research project from 2017 that I have been working with to new forums. Uh, the first thing is that we try to conceptualize. You know, and and contextualize uh, the def the definitions of hate speech. You know, normally when we talk about hate speech, there are so many definitions, and there is no consensus what hate speech is. You know, so this is the first task that we want to to to, to conceptualize. So in Thailand, uh, from our finding is that well, there is no consensus on that, and we can divide them into two different categories: loose definition and demanding definition. For the demanding definitions, means that. Well, the, the speakers, you know, ask or demand their audience, their followers to do something against the target, you know, and that one include rejection or separate the, the minority with the larger groups. And uh, the, the, the fourth level is that incite violence against the minority. So uh, the, the key finding from, from, from our data is that, well, there has been a big you know, a surprise on us as well, because this data has not been uh, under our control. You know, we got this data from the from the system uh, after we has key a certain uh, message and, and schemas. And you can see that, well, the, the, the final data is that uh, during around 12 months, we got uh, actually around 8,000 message on hate speech, but when we, uh, look very closely, we found around 1,000 messages can be, which can be considered as hate speech again, again, uh, Malay Muslim, you know. And this is a lot because we can see this volume and we can see that it is not uh, a flat, you know, there is, there is a kind of fluctuations of, of the message as well. And well, we want to know who is the producers of this hate uh, speech and well, what we see uh, on, on the Malay Muslim conflict is that well, it's, not, it's not a layman, you know, it's not a normal people that, that they just hate, you know, they just have a bias against, against minority. But it seems that this kind of hate speech has been organized very well. And we use this entire as, as a pet you know, because we don't want to, to name them as a, as a part of, you know, uh, information operations. Uh, but, you know, it is very suspicious that 
these pages, you know, are part of the information operations uh, uh, teams as well. So uh, if you see the next slide, uh, you can see that the top 10 pages, you know, that has produced uh, his, which again, Malay Muslim has been, you know, uh, well-known uh, a page that they use hate speech again, again, Malay Muslim. So another data is that uh, what we found is, well, we want to know whether these messages, you know, this hate speech uh, has been in which levels. Uh, and when we categorize data, we found that, well, unfortunately, that the, the data did not show that we are in the alarming situation. That means that the majority of the message, you know, has been on the first levels. That is the bias reproductions, you know, like they are calling Muslim as a cat or, you know, John Thai, uh, Southern Bandit, something like this. So there are, there are messages that reproduce the bias against minority. But when we see the, the, the demanding definition of head speech, we did not, we did not, uh, uh, found that you know this level has been on rise. You can see that the the light uh, that is red and orange, you know, has been uh, less than ten. You know, so it means that uh, the level of uh, hate speech again, Malay Muslim has not been on the on the on the inciting violence against them yet. And then another uh, questions that we want to a file is that is there any relations correlation between head speech and physical violence in the southern Thailand? Uh, we try to uh, use the data of physical violence, you know, from Deep South Watch, and we use them to compare with the data that we got from uh, a social media listening tool. And what we got is that well, no, that uh, the 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 relation between two lights, you know, between the greens. And red lights. Uh, red, uh, red light is 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 the data uh, from Deep South Watch uh, portray indicating about physical violence in Southern Thailand. So we can see that there is there is uh, insignificant uh, correlation between these two lines. Uh, and another thing that uh, that we found is that well, most of the message that has been uh, categorized as uh, uh, in in the in the level four, you know, has been exposed hate speech. That means, well, the, those pages that that we have found, they post hate speech uh, again, Malay Muslim after there is incident, you know, not before. So when we see this pattern, you know, we can compare to uh, others incident of ethnic cleansing or genocide, you know, like in Rwanda or you know, in Myanmar, most of uh, most of this case, you know, what we see is that there there has been a hair speech before, you know, uh, the, the 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 violence uh, happened against minority. So in the Thai case, you know, uh, the situation has been different. And this is going to be my perhaps uh, uh, second last point. Uh, is that well? In the in the previous uh, slide, has been uh, talking about the situation in southern Thailand. But in this slide, you know, uh, I'm going to to explain about the the national levels of hate speech between Buddhist and Muslim in country as a whole. You know, so the thing is that uh, we got another set of data about Buddhist nationalist movement around the country. You know, who has been using a hair speech against uh, a Muslim as a whole, not Malay Muslim, but as a uh, uh, Muslim as a target. So what we see is that there is an organized movement uh, against, against Muslim and producing hair speech against them as well. There is a constant effort. And the key message that this page has been trying to convey is that Buddhism is in decline. You know, so there is a need uh, for Buddhists in this era to come and protect the religions. And who's who is enemy of the of the of the Buddhism? You know, as you have seen from, from uh, Padma Abhishat uh, message, it's the same message 
that has been you know uh, uh, spread out around the country is that Islam and Muslim you know has been uh, coming and trying to invade this country, trying to control this country. So Muslim has been a target you know of this this uh, this campaign as well. Uh, this has been spelled out in uh, four key themes. The first one is anti Muslim related acts. You know there is a campaign against Muslim related acts as well that you know Buddhist countries you know as a Buddhist countries you know we have to abolish these acts you know from 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 the legal system. Uh, second theme is that well they try to protest against halal industry in this country and halal uh, halal mark, uh, trade mark as well. Uh, the third one is that they try to protest against uh, most constructions uh, in the in the north and northeast areas. And one of the uh, constanding uh, problems in, in this country is that uh, entire hijab, you know, has not been ended yet. Uh, there has been a constant effort, you know, to 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 protest against uh, a woman wearing hijab in the school as well. So. These are the key messages that we have found in, in the hate speech against Muslim uh, in general. So this is a cloud wording that we got from the system uh, that, well, you can see that the, the green uh, keyword is that, you know, we read in Thai, you know, because they feel that, you know, Thai people do not care much about this. So they want to awake Thai people uh, to be aware that, you know, Muslim uh, has been invading this country. Uh, another thing is that Muslim are access, existential threat, you know, to 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 this society. So uh, uh, for them, you know, they have to boycott Muslim, uh, and and Muslim are dangerous. So these are the key key team that we we receive uh, from 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 the system. So what I would like to perhaps uh, summarize on what I have said is that, well. Uh, what we have seen actually has been uh, a kind of confirmation of what Professor Duncan has been, you know, arguing since 2009, you know, that, well, a religious torrent has been in decline. And because of that as well, you know, we have seen that the conflict in Southern Thailand has been a kind of reasons for Buddhist nationalist movement around the country to use this as a reason to show that, well, uh, Muslim are really uh, dangerous, you know, in this country is there. Are, but the thing is that, you know, beyond beyond what what uh, we have seen in the country is that they have borrowed, you know, the, the 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 narrative from outside the country as well. And most of them, you know, came from the situation in Myanmar and Sri Lanka. That you know, especially Rohingya case, you know, they have been using this, you know, as an alarming uh, alarming indicator that you know, our Buddhist uh, a country has been, you know, in danger because the presence of Muslim and and Muslim has been uh, coming to control us. So uh, a combination of external and internal force, you know, uh, that involved Muslim minority has been used, you know, as a as a, as a tool for Buddhist nationalist movement in this country to campaign uh, uh, against Muslim minority. So uh, my last slide is that well. Uh, the work that I has been working with opportunity forums, you know, we, we it's, it's not finished yet. And what we have, you know, to do, uh, and we are trying to 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 accomplish, you know, uh, in these years, is that we are trying to to work on monitoring dangerous speech uh, in comparative perspective. Uh, and this kind of thing, you know, uh, this effort we have been uh, doing with many partners from inside and from. Uh, organizations uh, in Myanmar and Sri Lanka as well. Uh, the next step is that we want to 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 develop the lexicon of head speech in in certain Thailand, and if possible, you know, we want to develop as well the online head speech detections, so that you know we can use this as a, a early warning system in order to prevent you know uh, the the ethnic violence from happening. So. That is perhaps what I would like to, to say uh, uh, tonight on, on this topic, Professor Duncan. Thanks so much, uh, Jan Anwell. This is uh, really, really fascinating stuff. Um, 
as you say, it's a it, it's a topic that's very close to my own heart because it develops um, themes and issues that were around when I was doing field work in Patani 15 years ago, and sadly those issues haven't gone away. Uh, so maybe I can abuse my privilege. If people want to ask questions, please do so in the Q and A uh, rather than I, I saw. Maria Kaki raising her hand there. Maria, please put your question into the Q&A. Let me just kick things off because you hinted at this when you started talking about the, the IOs and the you know, role, potential or possible role of government agencies. Uh, I was involved in what I still think was a bit of a classic ICG report from 2007 about the emergence of Buddhist militias. And it turned out that those militia groups were being created by a serving police officer in his quote unquote spare time. So there was a kind of crossover between state and non-state. So how far is this really a reflection of a, a sort of conflict between non-state groups, between Buddhist civilians, as it were? And how far is what's going on, the hate speech being orchestrated by government actors of one kind or another who may be rather shadowy? So maybe I'm asking too many questions at once there. And also what happened to those Buddhist militias? Are there still these groups arming themselves and preparing to defend uh, the, the Thai Buddhist community in the deep South against some imaginary existential threat? Well, uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, well, you know, when, when I read your, your articles, uh, I had some questions, you know, well, if the situations, you know, look like so alarming, why, you know, after 10 years, there has been no extreme violence. There is no ethnic violence between uh, Buddhist militias and Malay Muslims, insurgents, you know. We have not seen that happen, right? But the thing is that, you know, well, I, I think this is, this is a strategy of, of the state itself. As you, as you, as you know, in certain Thailand, uh, the state has uh, militarized, you know, the areas. Uh, military still control the areas. Uh, we have a special uh, laws, you know, and enforcements in this in these areas. But the thing is that, well, I, I think Thai elites uh, are very smart on this as well. You know, they they do not fight uh, directly against the insurgents, and they know that this uh, this conflicts, you know, has not been a direct uh, uh, confrontation. It has been around the ideal ideological conflict as well. So they try to convince Malay Muslim, you know, uh, to, to understand that the conflict uh, uh, is, is not about religious uh, uh, connotations or, or religious cause. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, uh, when it's come to the combination of, between the state and non-state actors of fighting against Malay Muslim, you know, we have, you know, last, last uh, three months, you know, we have a, a focus groups with the Ruop Thai groups uh, and, and you have, I think, uh, interviewed them as well mm -hmm. during your, your mm -hmm. few words, you know. We also interviewed them as well uh, and, and we see that, you know, that, well, they don't, they don't see a need, you know, to, to use uh, violence against, against the, the, the Malay ethnic uh, uh, insurgent yet. You know, because why? Because they feel that the police or security, you know, actors or state agencies can control the country, can control the areas. So there is no need for them, you know, to, to, to go further and, and do it by, by themselves. And we have also an answer is that, well, Buddhists do not see a benefit on doing this directly, you know, against, against uh, uh, insurgents. Uh, if they do this, you know, well, the state itself is going to uh, lose uh, credit uh, credibility as well. So uh, what, uh, what, what I would answer, you know, uh, on, on your question is that, well, uh, what they are trying to do is that they want to uh, input, you know, on the, on the online platform that when, state, when, when the state use violence, Again, in certain, it is legitimate. It is reasonable, you know, to do that because they want to enforce the law, you know, and because Malay Muslim, you know, uh, deserve to be uh, organized in that way. Great, yeah. 
No, thanks. Thanks a lot, John. I mean, it's it's you and I could debate these things for hours, and I don't want to monopolize the the discussion by doing that <laughs> for too long. But clearly, what's fascinating here is. On the one hand, what you're saying is quite a good news story. Things have not got worse. Disturbing stuff was emerging 15 years ago, and it actually hasn't got dramatically worse. Those, uh, for want of a better term, Buddhist militias haven't really started mobilizing themselves in a direct way. But of course, one reason for that is that the Thai security forces have so successfully suppressed a lot of activity, and it created such a strong security clampdown across the region that, in a way, it's not necessary. So you, you also wonder whether it's it's a case of you know sack one thing. You know, they're just kind of waiting for the moment when they might be mobilized, and that that would be the scary part. But the good thing is they haven't been out there and doing that stuff yet. And so your story is not as disturbing as um, we feared it might be. Okay, let's um, take some of the other questions that have come in. Eric White, a regular questioner of ours, our old friend Eric, yeah. Is there any observational or ethnographic data on how online hate speech against Muslims does or does not fuel offline hate speech? This is one of the big questions. Is this stuff that's just, it's not, it doesn't really matter because it's, uh, all just people blowing off online, so it doesn't translate to anything. Or oh, how significant is it in fueling offline hate speech in private or public settings, or even in policy discussions within the state policy or legislative contexts? So, in a sense, is there any substance or impact of this online hate speech in the the offline world? Well, well, yes, it is a good question, and and well, in in our project, we try to understand this as as well. Is there any organic link, you know, between an online on-site platform? You know, the thing is that well, uh, there's a slide that I show the correlations between between hate speech and physical violence. You know, well, there is uh, that there is there's some events, you know, that we see that there is a hate speech. The hate speech has been used, you know, to explain violent incidents, but, you know, what we want to explain is that, well, the hate speech had its own life, you know, the, those, you know, IO pages, when they produce hate, hate speech, it's not because they want violence to happen. No, they have their own agenda. They, they want to reproduce certain bias, you know, or they want to uh, reproduce uh, Thai nationalisms, you know, so that you know, Muslim or, or Buddhist should uh, we, we feel that well, this is this is Thai country, you know. So you have to stick with that kind of you know uh, state nationalism. So there, there is agenda. There is a constant effort. That effort is not to incite violence all the time. So that means that what we what what we found the lie, the, the data on 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 hate speech, you know, has not been uh, correlated significantly with violent incident that happened on the ground. But when there is a violent and there is a hate speech, there is a hate speech that happened after violent incident. What does it mean? That, that means that those who use violence or has been organized to produce hate speech against Malay Muslim, they do not produce hate speech and they have an kind of intentions to to incite violence. What they have been trying to do is that they try to justify violence that, well, state have to do that because there is a reason on doing that, you know, because Malay Muslim or those people who has been subject to uh, state uh, suppressions are certain bandits, you know, or are insurgents so that, you know, they deserve to be uh, doing it that way. So that, that, that there are this kind of uh, hair switch, but you know, overall, overall, there is there is there is there is no significant correlation between online hair speech against Malay Muslim and the physical violence uh, in the area. Okay, so in in short, it sounds like on, the online hate speech is primarily a form of kind of ide sort of ideological warfare <laughs> rather than exactly. pr yes. the provocation of actual. Uh, offline violence. That, that's really clear. Thanks very much for that answer. Okay, from anonymous attendee, this is a question I think I've had every single time I've ever spoken about the uh, insurgency in the South. Is there any role that Malaysia plays in this whole issue? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Malaysia question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, perhaps to give a short answer is that we, we, we don't see a connection and we don't see a role playing uh, from Malaysian side, you know, or, or Malaysian uh, state, you know, to, to fuel uh, this head speech, you know, whether it's against uh, Malay Muslim or against Buddhist or against Thai state. We don't see uh, significant roles from, from, from Malaysia yet. Uh, and perhaps, well, we look forward, you know, to, to, to see the role playing by Malaysia to, to, to prevent or to reduce the, the level of hate speech uh, in, in, in this area. Thanks. Yeah. Every single time I've presented on this topic, I've had especially people from, uh, dare I say, Thai security officials and others insist to me that no, Malaysia is behind everything. M Malaysia bung lang <laughs> all the time. But uh, I don't think this particular topic lends itself very readily to the Malaysia behind it uh, answer. No. OK, so then we have another question from Rung uh, Rin Pratipon Kun. A very fascinating topic. On the slide, Buddhist nationalism and hate speech, the graph increased very rapidly Rapidly on the day, the 13th of December. What happened on that day? Was that the day that uh, Prameha Abhishad posted the hate speech on the first day? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the data that we, ha we, 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 we showed uh, tonight, you know, has not, has not been uh, related directly to Prameha Abhishad, you know, because mm -hmm. the event of Prameha Abhishad happened in, 2015 to 2017, you know, and our work, uh, 2015 to, two, to, to 2017, mm -hmm. yes, that is uh, uh, about Pramha Abhishat uh, 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 phenomenon. Uh, but, you know, Patani Forum start to work on this in 2017, you know, and we got the data that we, we, we used to show, uh, we, we, we show tonight, you know, is data from last year. So it has nothing to do with Pramha Abhishat already. So, so well, but this, this has to be clear. Yeah. But what happened on the day, uh, on the, on the uh, 13th of, of December? So I have to go back to see the, the slide. Uh, Thirteen, right? Oh, okay. Well, there is there is a peak, you know. Uh, uh, perhaps may I show the slide. Sure. Again. Yeah. I guess uh, it's about this this slide. Well. I was 17, right? That's uh, 13 of. Oh, well, no, normally there is, there is a confrontation, you know, or there is a violent, uh, violence uh, event that, that be, it's between the state and, 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 and Malay Muslim, you know. Uh, and if this happened, you know, we, we see the hair speech that came up after the event, you know, as I have said, to justify why the state have to do this and that, you know, but we can see that, well, when the state uh, uh, use a certain kind of violence against Malay Muslim, we do not see the increase of the physical violence, you know, uh, 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 also following. So that means the, the curve of the hair speech do not follow the curve of physical violence. And the curve of physical violence do not follow the curve of dental speech as well. But there is a certain amount that the IO pages, you know, use uh, uh, Facebook, you know, to, 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 to justify why state is doing uh, violence against Malay Muslim. So that is, you know, most of the time that we have seen. And also, but it's not about the violence that happened uh, on the Facebook and YouTube, you know. Uh, there is uh, events, you know, that, you know, they talk about uh, the, 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 the incident in Crusade and Takbai, you know, uh, in the clubhouse. Uh, 
around uh, February, they, they interview, you know, uh, Taksin uh, on, on that day, you know, and Taksin did, did not answer uh, on this question very well. You know, so there is, there is a question on this as well. So we, we, we see a certain kind of thing, you know, uh, pick up on this, on this day, but it has nothing to do with the real violence on the ground. Uh, that is perhaps uh, explanation uh, for me. Right, because I'm I'm trying. To, the the tie is very small. It's a little bit hard to see on my laptop. But you've actually got an explanation each time. There's a peak. You have an explanation. One is Taxon talking about uh, stuff on Clubhouse, and there's an explanation for each of the four points that you have on there uh, relating to external events of one kind or another. So you you have you 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 haven't really explained that in your talk so clearly. But on the in the text of your graph, there is a kind of a speculative explanation as to why it might be that this has come up because there's some moment of intense public discourse around a particular topic, right? Can you tell us what the other ones are? Uh, again, please. Quickly. You have the uh, they mean, have, you have the tax in clubhouse one. What is the last one, which I think is the one that the questioner was referring to on that slide? Oh, okay. Uh, Show the slide. Just this one. This one. Right? This one, right? Um, okay. Maybe the last one of those, yeah. Yeah, the, the last one was, was the confrontations, you know, uh, mm -hmm. between the state and Malay Muslim. Know, which happened in, uh -huh. in Patani. Right. And, and um, on, on, on the last one, you know, this has been a hair speech, you know, focusing on justification of the violence mm -hmm. right. against Malay Muslim. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but you can see others, you know, event, you know, they are not related to the direct violence on the ground. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's quite complicated, but there's always something going on at the point when all this hate speech appears. It's a reflection of, of larger stuff that's going on online, particularly in the Twitter sphere, I guess, around certain issues. OK, we have a couple more questions and not very much time. So let's try and do really quick answers to these if we can. Has the Thai state implemented any international human rights law? International customary law, e.g. ICCPR, concerning the limitations on freedom of speech to prevent religion-oriented hate speech? Well, uh, we have also, you know, uh, interview a lawyer as well doing mm. our yep. few works, you know, and, and, and uh, the suggestions uh, or recommendations from the lawyer is that, you know, in order to combat against hate speech, you know, it's not a good idea to use law. You know, because mm -hmm. when you use law, this means you're going to curtains uh, freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So it's not a good idea to to encourage the state, you know, to use right. law uh, to curb uh, hate speech uh, against against mm -hmm. any any actors. You know, right. so hate speech should be a part of free speech. Right. Uh, that is that is perhaps <laughs> uh, one of the ironic uh, statement. Uh, but you know, right. uh, within. So now we are working on dangerous speech, you know, so we move mm -hmm. from, danger, uh, from hate speech to dangerous speech mm. because these two concepts are uh, interlinked, you know. But the thing is that if we want to uh, protect freedom of speech, you know, we have to allow people who hate each other to express their hate. But that kind of expression should not go to the limitations, which is a dangerous speech. You know, when you incite mm -hmm. Uh, violence when you ask your followers, you know, your 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 listeners, your your audience, you know, to to, to arm themselves and then go and kill others. No, mm. this is this is over. This is this is over the limitations. So there is a law uh, on that one already, you know, that that has been uh, used, but uh, to 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 curb uh, hate speech by using law, I think is not a good idea uh, per se. That is, right. that you, is have a, you have a lot of uh, doubts about that because possibly not all of us <laughs> trust not all of us trust the Thai state to use these laws in the ways that they we might imagine they should be used. There's a lot of 
possibility of manipulating laws, as we know, in ways that uh, have unfortunate side effects. Okay, let me very quickly summarize the last question, again from uh, Rungrin Pratiporn Kun, who's doing fieldwork in Yaha and found that not all the Malay Muslims are so friendly towards Thai Buddhists who uh, wanting to get to know them, and asked if there is online, offline hate speech against non-Muslims from the Malay Muslim side as well. Is this a two-way street? Well, well, this is a good question. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, uh, in in our project, we 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 do both. You know, uh, we we categorize uh, the hate speech against Malay Muslim, and we also, you know, try to investigate whether there is a hate speech against Buddhist or not. You know, but I did not show on 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 the slide because the hate speech against Buddhist in the country uh, in, in 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 southern thailand has been very very small if compared to hate speech against minority in the country so of course yes there is a hate speech against buddhists as well even you know when you when when you call uh, a buddhist in southern thailand as a uh, as a ca you know mm. ca itself has has a negative connotations right is <laughs> some kind of uncivilized you know uh, so well, there is a head speech against against Buddhists as well. Of course, there is. But if you compare the amount or the volumes of head speech, you know, from these two sides, we saw the head speech from 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 IO pages, you know, much more than the the, the head speech that has been produced by Malay Muslim themselves. That that is perhaps uh, uh, my 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 answer to to this question. Thanks a lot. Uh, we do have one more question that we've got in twice, but unfortunately, I can't actually understand it very well. What do you think hate speech come from military or state agency IO? If you said we should use who produce hate speech, I have to say I, I've read that several times and I don't get Did what the see? question is. <laughs> yes, I don't really <laughs> okay. get the uh, I don't really get the question. Maybe you can follow the logic of it and give a really quick answer, no more than about a minute. <laughs> John, thanks. If, if, if you, if you use, well, uh, the, the thing is that you know the the the, the top ten pages that I have shared, you know, mm. on, on, on the slide, uh, the result has not been uh, from us. You know, the, the system, the social listening tool system, you know, right. uh, provides us with that list, you know, who has produced the hate speech the most. Uh, so we just, you know, collect based on the data, and then show you that well, these pages are are, are the page that produce uh, hate speech against Malay Muslim the most. So the thing is that we don't know who behind those pages, you know, those who uh, uh, those pages that we mark as N, N in Thailand, you know, we, we just we just use the name Niranam because we don't know right. uh, who is behind those pages, and. Actually, we should not say is I O, you know, because mm, right. we don't know who, who who behind it. But we know from the behavior of the pages that uh, the effort has been to justify violence for the state. That is one. The second is that they try to reproduce certain bias against Malay Muslim. For instance, like well, because Malay Muslim uh, uh, certain bandits, you know, they kill. Uh, people, you, they, they kill soft target, you know, normal people. So they are deserved to be, to be, to be killed as well. So, so the thing is that we do not know who behind that. And the thing is, if we can improve this situation, we have to contact Facebook. We have to work with, you know, like tech company, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook or YouTube, you know, to to curb this this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, trend. Yes, and we've obviously seen very abundant evidence in recent parliamentary no confidence debates that these IOs exist. <laughs> there's no, <laughs> there's no doubt that IOs are being orchestrated at the highest levels uh, in the Thai state. Uh, but exactly how it works and exactly how to deal with it is an incredibly difficult problem. Yes, if you just get inside the line groups and start talking about it in Parliament, then they'll all have to sign off them. But um, yeah we have got this fairly endemic problem and what what i guess you're seeing in this in the context of the southern hate speech is just a, one manifestation of a very large problem in the thai uh, social media sphere which is the the mysterious operations of these 
of these shadowy IOs, which may or may not exactly be IOs, but probably are. This has been absolutely fascinating. We've had some great questions and um, we could talk for, for much longer, but I think this has been a, a fantastic opportunity to air these important perspectives to find out more about what is happening in the Deep South, which we haven't touched on so far in the Thailand Social Science Seminar Series. And you, you, you've just got a fantastic project, you and your team, uh, Jan Anwar and the Batani Forum colleagues. So we look forward to, I know you have a lot of stuff. You've got a website, haven't you, with all this stuff on? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, maybe you can um, just tell us how to access that. And um, what's what's the name of your website? It's the Patani Forum, right? Yeah, just Patani Forum. Patani with, Patani, Patani with one T. Google that and you'll find all kinds of stuff about this ongoing yeah. project with all sorts of things that we haven't had time to talk about today. So it's great work that you're doing. Please keep up that good work. And thanks very much to our audience and partners for making this event possible. And we will be uploading it so that th those who missed the live broadcast will be able to see it again. Thank you so much. Thank you for having Jan. me. Oh, it's been, a, it's been a huge pleasure. And I hope I can get back to Patani and hear more about it firsthand before long. Yes, yes. We look forward you know, to having you here. Thanks a lot. All right. Have a good night. <laughs>